Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. If you've been following us this quarter, you know we've been talking about the book of Hebrews, and the theme has been, in these last days, the message of Hebrews. But today, lesson number nine is about Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. We have enjoyed so much studying the book of Hebrews, and if you've been following week to week, you know that it has been exciting, revealing, uplifting Christ as our only hope. If you'd like to follow us by having a lesson, you can do it one of two ways. You can download it by going to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and download a digital copy, or better yet, find a local Seventh-day Adventist church, walk in and say 3ABN sent you, and you can have an excursion together as a group walking through this exciting and revealing book. But nonetheless, don't go away. We'll be right back in just a moment to begin this journey together. Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are at lesson number nine, and that welcome might be welcome back, because if you've been here from week to week, you know we've been walking through a book that has just been, oh, I says exponentially mm -hmm. revealing to us things that we knew, but we really know now. <laughs> and praise the Lord, it's been a blessing, hasn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. And our Sabbath School panel has done their homework, but there's something that happens when we get together. Uh, I could only compare it to saying, you know, you can watch Thanksgiving on television, it might look good, but you gotta be at the uh -huh. table to enjoy uh -huh. how it tastes. Mm. And it tastes so good at this table because I thank the Lord for the diligent work put in the hours and uh, the time and the prayer to try to communicate to you as clearly as we can what the Word of God says, and specifically on this quarter, what the book of Hebrew talks about. Mm -hmm. Today we're talking about Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Is there any sacrifice better than the sacrifice of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The answer is absolutely not. But before we go any further, first let's go ahead and reintroduce you. If you're new to our family, be introduced. But if you've been here week to week, you know these are family members. To my immediate left is Jill Marconi. Good to have you here, Jill. Thank you, Pastor John. Privileged to be here and excited about the study. And what are you covering today? Diverse kinds of sacrifices. Okay, and Ryan, good to have you here, Ryan. Amen, it's always a blessing to be a part of this panel. And today, I'm gonna to be covering on Tuesday's lesson, Jesus' perfect sacrifice. Shelley, always good to have you here. Thank you, it's always good to be here when I can. Uh, today, I'll cover the cross and the cost of forgiveness. I like that. James? Judgment and the character of God. Good to be here too. See James. And, <laughs> see James and John. We we have the ends taken care there of. You go. <laughs> but it's always good to have each one of you here today. And uh, Jill, I would like to ask you to pray for us sure. today. Holy Father, we're just grateful that Jesus was our perfect sacrifice, mm -hmm. and through Him, we have the gift of salvation. And right now, we open up our minds and hearts to receive what Your Holy Spirit wants to teach us through Your Word. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Jill. Let's go to that particular lesson. And if you have your quarterly, I would encourage you to just kind of pull that down off the shelf and follow along with us as we talk about Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. The, um, the memory verse for today is from the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. I'll go ahead and read that. And here it is. For by one offering, mm. he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Oh, I don't want you to miss that, those who are being sanctified. Mm -hmm. We have been sanctified, we are being sanctified, and we will be sanctified by the, mm -hmm. by the eternal aspects. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Amen. The beauty of the work of Christ, it is not only it's not only immediate, it's continual, and then it has an eternal and immortal impact on us. Mm. I've been thinking about this, why were sacrifices needed? That's a huge question. Mm. Yeah. Why were sacrifices needed? And the short answer is where there is no shedding of blood, mm. there is no remission of sin. Sure. In one of our prior lessons, Shelley made the statement that God established the penalty for transgression. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. 
So when you stand before the judge in any court setting, uh, if you are guilty, what do you ask for? And if you are innocent, what do you ask for? <laughs> if you're guilty, don't ask for justice. You want mercy. You want mercy. Yeah. But if you're innocent, what do you ask for? <laughs> justice. justice. And so when we look at what the Lord has done, the Apostle John says, love has been perfected in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And mm -hmm. I thought about that, you know, come boldly before the throne mm -hmm. of grace, mm -hmm. have boldness in the day of judgment. And uh, it almost sounds to some degree we will have, um, I don't want to use the word arrogance, but it seems like we could just run to the Lord. Well, in fact, that's exactly it's what it's saying. Yeah. Yes, it Abba, is. Father. When the covenant relationship has accomplished the mending of both hearts to one, when you and your father are one and there is no gap between you because you love each other, he loves you and provides for you, you love him and are obedient to him, then you can run to him for any and everything. So I want to say to you today at the very beginning of the outset, because of the efficacious sacrifice of Jesus, we can run to him and know that we are going to be received by an eternal Father and a Lord that keeps us and strengthens us all the way. Hebrews 9, verse 15. Let's look at this together. Hebrews 9, verse 15. The Bible says, And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Hallelujah. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal yeah. inheritance. Mm. You know, the first covenant was continually practiced, mm -hmm. but it was just to be the foundation or the groundwork to remind people that when Jesus comes, right. he would be able to ratify all Amen. of yeah. that. Amen. He would be able to, as was the case for many truckers, he would be able to seal everything that we have put inside of the trailer. Mm -hmm. If the seal is not there, then we have no uh, guarantee that the work he has done is sufficient. Mm -hmm. But when Paul says that his grace is sufficient for us, he brings out another component that I want to emphasize, which was very much a part of the first covenant because of the people. Why is his grace sufficient for us? Because in our weakness, mm. his strength is made perfect. Mm. And that's something that the Israelites missed. They thought that the sacrifice was sufficient for their weakness, but it wasn't because the sacrifice and the people, they were both weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why there was a need for a more perfect sacrifice. There was a need for a more perfect uh, lamb. Nothing that the people could have done could have made their work uh, sufficient. Mm -hmm. So Jesus had to come. So we find in Hebrews 9:15. It explains that the death of Jesus as a sacrifice had the purpose of providing redemption. Yeah. It was providing something, not just substituting, but it was also a sacrifice of provision, providing redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Mm -hmm. What is that saying? Think about how many thousands of years those sacrifices were going on. Mm. And then somebody, let's just say 3,000 years later, say, um, <laughs> Was that okay? Did we do that? Did we do okay? Right. And, and then the response was, if he's victorious, yeah. everything you did is not in vain. Amen. That's right. But if he's not victorious, you just did 3,000, 4,000 years of work for no <laughs> apparent benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. How, that's how the salvation of humani <laughs> humanity teetered like the fulcrum point on a, on a seesaw. Jesus became the fulcrum point between the first covenant and the second covenant or the more perfect covenant. But the covenant hadn't changed. It was continuous all the way through. That's why Jeremiah made it very clear. Let's go to Jeremiah 34. And I want you to see how in verse 18 and 19, he points out why the sacrifices were necessary to atone for sin and ratify the covenant made between the parties involved. Jeremiah 34, verse 18 and 19. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant mm -hmm who have not performed the words of the covenant, which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. It was in fact an exercise whenever there was a covenant made, yeah. they would separate the animal and walk between them as a sign of I'm accepting this covenant. I agree to this covenant. But look at verse 19, the princes of Judah 
the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. Now, why did he mention the princes of Judah, Jerusalem, the eunuchs, and all the priests? He says, as they made a covenant with one another and with me, I'm making a covenant with them. Yeah. Now, he becomes, and when you go to Ephesians now, the Bible says he broke down that middle wall That's of right. partition. That's right. Because the walking between, there was a separation between uh, one portion of the temple and the other. And that curtain even itself, Jesus became that middle partition. So he removed the temporary partition. He made all of those who were separated by the ceremonial systems. And let me add this component. You had to be an Israelite. You had to be a Jew. You had to be circumcised to participate in the ceremonial services. But when the Gentiles came in, the circumcision of the heart mm -hmm. was more important to Christ than the circumcision of the flesh, mm -hmm. which was a necessity under the first covenant. We find in Hebrews chapter 9, let's look at verse 6 and 7, why the sacrifices were necessary. Hebrews 9, verse 6 and 7. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, that is the sacrifices, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, yes. which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. I want to add something here. This is something we don't often focus on, committed in ignorance. Mm -hmm. Paul the Apostle says, if we willfully sin, mm -hmm. there's a difference between a sin and iniquity. Iniquity is this continual willful sin. But in the growth aspect of preparing for that eternal day, in our journey, as, as David the Psalmist says, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. Mm -hmm. The falling aspect is not the Bible saying, just go ahead and intentionally fall, intentionally participate mm -hmm. in things that's going to make you fall. No, because it says in Jude 24, unto him who was able to keep you from falling. Amen. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that I'm going to be a sinner continuously until the day mm -hmm. that I'm perfected. No, overcoming by the blood of the lamb is, is available now. That's right. Mm -hmm. He says, right. my children, I write to you that you not sin. So he's not saying just keep on sinning. That's not what he told the woman at the well. He said, she said, he said go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So whatever you were confronted with, whatever challenge you had in your life, because Jesus is the one who provides the sacrifice, he doesn't just provide a sacrifice to forgive you of your sin. He provides the grace and the strength to make you an overcomer over that sin. Amen. So, so a lot of people say, well, that's just how I am. <laughs> and we make excuses for continuing in a broken character, not seeking the sufficiency that is in Christ. Mm -hmm. So when he says Good. his grace is sufficient for us in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. It's not saying keep on being weak. No, it is saying that in Christ, I can do all things. That is also including the overcoming of the transgression that at one point, cause you to stumble so easily, laying aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets you. Don't carry the weight, lay it aside. That's right. That's why Revelation 12 and verse 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, what does that mean, did not love their lives to the death? It is also uh, a comparison to, to the dedication and the obedience of Jesus. He was obedient unto the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. It's not just saying that they are willing to be martyrs for their faith. It's far deeper than that. They are willing to be obedient even if it means giving their lives to maintain an unbroken relationship in yeah. obedience to Christ. A lot of people are not obedient to the death because when death is mentioned, they're ready to give it up. Mm -hmm. I'm not dying for that. No true dedication to Christ and an example of our gratitude for what he has done would make us obedient even unto the death. Mm -hmm. And so we see Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Only in Christ and through the better sacrifice is that made possible. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor John. I love that beautiful foundation. I'm Jill Morricone and I have Monday's lesson, Diverse Kinds of Sacrifices. Now, to me, this was an incredible study. We know, as Pastor John said so beautifully, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus died to fulfill the claims of the law. The wages of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, through his shed blood. But as we look at Monday's lesson, diverse kind of sacrifices, to be honest with you, I learned a lot because I have not spent a great deal of time studying the sacrificial system. Mm -hmm. The overarching themes, of course, I've studied, but not really super in detail. So this has been a great study for me. Amen. We're going to look at the five major types of sacrificial offerings. We're going to look at the meaning of each one of those types, what it represented, mm -hmm. how it was fulfilled in Christ, and then the application. So we're going to do the meaning, the representation, and the application. And those five types are all found in the book of Leviticus. Type number one, I'll tell you the five and then we'll unpack them all. Number one is the burnt offering. Number two is the grain offering. Number three is the peace offering or the fellowship offering. Mm -hmm. Number four is the sin offering or the purification offering. Number five, I call it the restitution offering because to me that makes more sense, but you could call it the reparation offering. So let's unpack those. What in the world do all these mean? Let's look at the burnt offering. You find that in Leviticus chapter one. What is the meaning of the burnt offering? They actually offered the, the Israelites, they would offer a sheep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was a goat. Sometimes it was a bull. Sometimes it was a bird. It always had to be without blemish. This was an atonement offering. The burnt offering, the key point in the burnt offering is that the entire animal was to be consumed on the altar. Everything was to be burned except for the hide or the skin of the animal. Everything else was to be burned. Of course, the person would place their head, their hand on the head of the animal. And then that animal was accepted to make atonement for them. This is, of course, looking forward by faith to Jesus, the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. So what's the representation of the burnt offering? Christ's entire life was consumed for you and for me. Remember yeah. the entire animal yeah. was yeah. consumed on the altar? Mm -hmm. Christ's entire life is consumed. Hebrews 7, 27. Who does not need daily, this is referring to Jesus, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus gave himself completely, entirely. His entire life was consumed for our salvation. We also say, we, we don't have time to read it, but in Philippians chapter 2, we have this reference of Jesus being God, right. being equal with God, giving up that station, coming down to this earth, taking the form of a servant, right. and then humbling himself to death on the cross. We see that entire sacrifice of himself when he came down. What is the application for us today? The blood of Jesus is to cover all of us. Not just one piece, but entirely. Forgiveness is complete. Forgiveness is total, but surrender and submission to God are to be complete and total. Many times we only give a portion of the offering. We don't give a burnt offering. Okay, God, you can have this portion of me, but I'm keeping back a portion for myself because I don't want my entire life to be consumed mm. or to be surrendered right. or to be given to God. Let's look at offering number two. This is the grain offering. And this was not an offering for atonement. And this offering had no blood, no flesh. There was no death involved in this offering. It did not have the purpose of providing atonement. It was actually a gift of gratitude mm. for God's provision in sustaining his people. Now, what's interesting with all the offerings, I just thought this was an interesting side note, they added salt as a preservative, mm. symbolizing the permanence of God's covenant with his people. All the offerings, they added salt. So what is the representation of this? Remember, this grain offering is a gift of gratitude for God's provision in sustaining his people. Christ is the one who provides eternal life. He is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. The grain offering, he is the bread of life. John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. You see, Christ sustains us. 
Christ provides eternal life for us. That's right. Jesus is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. And what's the application for us today? We need to feed on Jesus, the Word. We need to feed on Him and His Word. In addition to that, I believe we need to walk in recognition of His provision for our lives. Mm -hmm. If this offering is a gift of gratitude for God's provision and sustaining His people, clearly every day I need to recognize He is my God. That's right. He is my Creator. He is my Savior. He is my Redeemer and soon coming King. <laughs> Let's look at offering number three. This is the peace offering or the fellowship offering. Now, in this case, the offerer ate, not just the priest. Mm. So the person bringing the offering would partake of the flesh as well. Now, they did not partake of the fat or the blood, but they would partake of certain portions. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the offering was to praise God. This was not an atonement offering either. The grain offering is not atonement, and the peace offering is not an atonement offering. They could bring a male or a female animal, which is interesting, without blemish to the Lord. This would be a communal meal with friends and family to celebrate the well-being provided by God. Mm -hmm. So what's the representation of this? Remember the offerer would partake of the meal together. Mm -hmm. The representation, you and I, are to spiritually partake of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now this is really fascinating. Remember this is called the peace offering? I've always thought of Jesus' sacrifice in terms of blood, right? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. His blood covers my sins. His blood covers my death. That's how I have processed it. But also there's a lot in peace involved with his death. Romans 5.1, mm -hmm. having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why? Mm -hmm. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean that Jesus' sacrifice provides peace for us? Think about Isaiah 53. This is, of course, referring to Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our, what's that word? Peace, Peace. was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. His sacrifice provided peace for us. Ephesians 2, 14, he himself is our, what's that word? Peace. Peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of yes. separation. Now that's something I want to study more, is the sacrifice of Jesus providing peace. You and I, participate in this sacrifice by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. We see this in John 6. Now let's look at the sin offering or the purification offering. This is offering number four. Now this is most definitely an atonement offering. Of the five offerings, three of them were atonement offerings. The burnt offering was for non-defiant type of sins. The sin offering, which we're discussing right now, was for non-deliberate sins. The restitution offering, which is offering number five, was for misusing holy things. And you can see this in Leviticus 4 and 5, the sin offering. The interesting point is that the blood was applied to the outer altar in the courtyard. So the blood in this offering is more prominently displayed than in the other offerings. Mm. The representation, Christ redeemed me. His life was provided. His blood redeems us from sin. He says in Matthew 26, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, why? For the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. What's the application for you and I today? We are to accept his blood mm -hmm. that can cover our sin. Mm -hmm. Finally, number five, we're running out of time, the restitution offering or the reparation offering. Now this was also an atonement offering, but the interesting thing is that the person who brought the offering was required to make restitution. Mm -hmm. Not only did they bring the sacrifice, but they had to pay a penalty of 20% to restore what was wrongfully taken. It represents that Jesus Christ has paid the debt for my sin. Mm -hmm. He does not just redeem me by his blood, but he paid the debt that I owed. Mm -hmm. And it says that you and I today, even though we come to God and we ask for forgiveness, there are times when if we have wronged someone else, God requires us to make mm -hmm. restitution for what we have done and to pay that back. That is the restitution offering. Amen. Wow. Wow, Jill, thank you so much. And I'm so glad the way you did that, unpack that, because I, I kind of led into it by seeing the sin of ignorance mm -hmm. and how powerful it is. You know, we have a lot more to go, 
Uh, so don't go away. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Mm. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom a clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our Sabbath School panel. I am going to give the time now to Ryan Day as he talks about... Jesus, perfect sacrifice. Okay. <laughs> That's the title of the overall lesson. And uh, I certainly appreciated that foundation. It was very, very precise and very helpful in us understanding deeper what this means by Christ or Jesus' perfect sacrifice. I have Tuesday's lesson, of course. And the lesson starts out by having us read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, as well as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. So let's go to those passages. Hebrews chapter 7, first, verse 27. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Who does not daily need, uh, need daily, this is of course referring to Christ, as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for, notice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. I love that. He did this once for all when he offered up himself. I love that. And of course, go on to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. This same message is echoed. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By that way we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. There it is again, once for all. Of course, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, which is why he could only be offered up once and only for all because he is the perfect sacrifice. The Levitical priest daily as brought out in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27, as well as every year as brought out clearly in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, offered gifts and sacrifices that cannot perfect the conscience of the worker. And of course, we, this is also clearly communicated in Hebrews 9, verses 9 and 10, as well as Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. There's going to be lots of scripture, so get ready. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Notice what the Bible says. Again, bringing out the fact that uh, uh, this cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered. There it is, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with food and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Of course, Jill covered that a little bit in, in depth there as she went through the different uh, uh, sin or the different offerings. But Hebrews chapter 10 verses one through four goes a little deeper in expressing this as well. Notice Hebrews chapter 10 verse Verses one through four. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more a conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. All of that, of course, as the Bible makes it very clear, were types and shadows pointing forward to the perfect sacrifice, which we find in Christ Jesus, who died once for all, as the scripture plainly says. Jesus' sacrifice is superior to the sacrifice of animals because, notice this, Jesus was the Son of of God. He was perfect in and of himself who perfectly fulfilled God's will according to That's Hebrews right. chapter 10 verses 5 through 10. In fact, let's go to Hebrews 7 again. We've read this text many times, but again, this amplifies this message in communicating what we're establishing today as Christ's perfect sacrifice. So Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to read verses 26 to 28 and notice what the Bible says here. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he died, here it is, here it is again, once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected for 
forever. Yes. I love that. He has been perfected forever. My mind goes back to that beautiful prophetic text of the 70 weeks prophecy where it says he, speaking of Christ, confirmed the covenant with many for one week. But in the midst of that week, he brought, brought an end to sacrifice and offering. Amen. Only Christ can confirm the covenant. Only Jesus' blood can bring an end to all sacrifice and offering. It is very, very clear. Hebrews 10, and we're going to read verses 5 through 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. It says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering." Burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Mm -hmm. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. There it is again, once for all, my friends. Once Jesus Christ died, it was done once for all. He yeah. completed the work because his sacrifice was indeed a perfect sacrifice. First, Jesus' sacrifice is perfectly uh, effective and never to be surpassed. The sacrifices of the Levitical priests were repeated because they were not effective. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, as we read earlier, would no longer have any consci consciousness of sins. Second of all, okay, this is important. The different kinds of sacrifices of the Old Testament found their fulfillment at the cross. Thus, Jesus not only cleanses us from sin. This is huge. Please, please get this. Not only cleanses us from sin, he also provides sanctification, as we see there in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14, which I believe we're going to read in just a moment. It says, uh, it says here, uh, I lost my place. There we go. Uh, Jesus not only cleanses us from sin, he also provides sanctification by putting sin away from our lives. Yeah. This is huge. I, and, and, and Pastor alluded to this earlier, mm -hmm. and I just want to re-emphasize and uh, imply, uh, apply here very clearly that a lot of people's idea of the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross simply uh, for the means of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus died on the cross so that I might have forgiveness. And that's true. Christ did die so that we might have forgiveness. But he died, my friends, for much more than just forgiveness. Christ also died that we might have complete victory over sin. That's Amen. where that sanctification mm -hmm. process comes. In fact, okay. it's implied and very clearly communicated in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, when it says, if we confess our sins, he is just to forgive us our sins. And then people stop right there. Mm -hmm. But they don't read the next part. And to cleanse Amen. us from all all unrighteousness. My friends, the cross, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus was yes to pay the penalty, yes to provide a way for forgiveness, but to also pave the way and to make it a reality that just as Christ was able to overcome the mm -hmm. sin of the world, we also through him and through his shed blood and through his power can also overcome sin. Amen. Before the priests could approach God in the sanctuary and minister in behalf of their fellow human beings, they had to be cleansed and sanctified or consecrated. And when you read about this in Leviticus chapter 8 and 9, we're not going to read it. I'm just referencing it so you can go read it for homework. Leviticus 8 and 9. Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us and consecrates us so that we may approach God with confidence and serve him as a royal priesthood. So now we go to Hebrews chapter 10 and you see this very clearly communicated in Hebrews 10 verses 10 through 14 as well as 19 through 23. So let's notice what the Bible says here in Hebrews 10 verses 10 through 14. It says, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. There it is once more, once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, I love that, once for all, forever, he is set down at the right hand of God from that time waiting until the enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And then now you go down to verses 19 through 23, it continues. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Notice you're not going into the holiest unless it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Mm -hmm. And the lesson has this final comment here. It says, finally, Jesus' sacrifice also provides nourishment for our spiritual life. I love that. It provides an example that we need to observe and follow. Thus, Hebrews invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, especially the events of the cross, and follow His lead. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, we've we've quoted this so many times. In fact, it's probably the theme of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, but I'm looking at verse 2 here. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him. And why was that joy set before Him? Why did He look unto that with joy? Because God is love. Mm. Christ is love. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. My friends, plain and simple, Jesus' sacrifice, the only sacrifice, was perfect. Oh, that, uh, absolutely. Once for all, he is the perfect sacrifice. I'm Shelley Quinn, and my lesson today is the cross and the cost of forgiveness. We always talk about the free gift of God, which is salvation by grace through faith. Grace is free to us, but I want you to know it cost God everything. He had to become a man and die to shed the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's the cost of grace, but that's how much God puts a value on your life. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 22. Hebrews 9, 22. According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You can think back to Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned and they lost that covering of light that they found themselves naked, What did God have to do? Mm. He killed an animal to provide skins to cover their sins. So without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's That's right. right. Verse 23, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, that would be the earthly copies, the sanctuaries, should be purified with these, with these sacrifices of the animals. But the heavenly things, the heavenly sanctuary, should be purified with some, a better sacrifice than these. And that was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 24, Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands like the tabernacle on earth, which are just copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He sits at the right hand of the throne as the last Adam, the new representative of mankind. He intercedes for us continually. And it says, not that he should, uh, verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest does when he enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, then It says in verse 26, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, ever since Christ showed up, this is the end of the ages. Things are coming to a culmination. He came to perform God's will and achieve God's will. So now at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. I have to pause here and say this. He died for all, Mm -hmm. but he will only bear the sins for many because Mm -hmm. it will only be those who receive him as Lord and Savior of their life. Mm -hmm. To those who eagerly wait for him, it continues, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Hallelujah. See, the old... The sanctuary of the old covenant was nothing but a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 8, 5, uh, God is talking about this and it says that those priests, the earthly priests, the Levitical priests, served the copy 
and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For God said to him, Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The Ark of the Covenant, when, when you saw the tabernacle, there was the outer court where the burnt altar burnt offering was. There was the holy place where we had the table of showbread, the incense that was uh, before the veil, and we had the seven branch candlestick. But behind the veil was the Holy of Holies. Only once a year did the high priest go in there. The Holy of Holies had the Ark of the Covenant this was the symbolic of the throne of God. The Ten Commandments were inside the ark because the Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's government. It was in the old covenant, it is in the new covenant. And above the Ten Commandments was the mercy seat because mercy always triumphs triumphs judgment between the cherubim, the Shekinah glory of God would come down and he would sit on his throne. That throne, that ark was a symbol of God's government. Yes. So Psalm 97 two says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne mm -hmm. as the omnipotent ruler. God is our judge. He bears judicial responsibility to be fair. He's got to vindicate the innocent, mm -hmm. but he must judge and punish the guilty. Let me tell you something. Justice is to get what you deserve. Mm -hmm. Mercy is not to get what you deserve, mm -hmm. but grace Grace is to receive what you don't deserve. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 34, 7, it talks about God. He's speaking himself saying, he keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. Mm -hmm. His way of judging affects the public perception of righteousness mm -hmm. of his government. So to carry out justice. He's a just God and to carry out justice, God had to become a man to take right. on our flesh so that he could die in our place, paying that penalty. And you know what? That makes him both just mm -hmm. and the justifier right. because he bears our sin. In the original Hebrew, the word for forgiveness means to bear, mm. to carry our sin. So under the old covenant system, which pointed to Christ, everything mm. about it, there were two phases of cleansing from sin. The first, the sinner brought an animal sacrifice. He placed his hands on the little sacrifice, the lamb, transferring his sins from himself to the substitute and then <laughs> cut its throat. Now, I'm saying that, and I did that. Uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful. Can you imagine what it would be like to cut the throat of a little baby lamb mm. because you sinned? Mm. Boy, it make, I think you would think mm. about it twice before you sinned again. But the blood of the animal was daubed on the horns of the altar. Um, and, and then that's the burnt offer, offer the altar burnt offering. Mm -hmm. And then it was transferred before the veil. It was sprinkled before the veil that separated the holy and most holy place. So the sin was symbolically transferred to God himself. It allowed God to show justice and mercy at the same time. But the second phase of cleansing of sin was done once a year on the Day of Atonement, the only day that the high priest and only the high priest could go behind the veil. Now, we've got a whole study coming up on the veil. It's fabulous. But the high priest went behind the veil to, to, in the Holy of Holies to cleanse the sanctuary of sin. Now, listen to the, what our author of our quarterly says, at the end of the year on the Day of Atonement, which was 
the day of judgment, God would cleanse the sanctuary, clearing his judicial responsibility by transferring the sins from the sanctuary to the scapegoat, Azazel. 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 One day I'll pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Azazel, who represented Satan. You find that in Leviticus 16, 15 through 22. But then the author goes on and says, those who confess their sins during the year showed loyalty to God by observing a solemn rest and afflicting themselves on the day of atonement. Those who did not show loyalty would be cut off. Mm. Mm. Wow, yeah. that's eye-opening. It makes sense that Jesus, as our substitutionary sacrifice, mm. cleansed the heavenly temple. Everything was a pattern, so it had to be done. There had to be a cleansing. The, what happened at that time, the vindication of God's character, because the cosmic conflict has all been about God's character. And what happened is Christ transferred sin to its rightful author, Satan. Amen. 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 Praise God. These lessons have been incredible. They've mm -hmm. been such a blessing in the book of yes. Hebrews. I have Thursday's lesson, which is really going to pick up, Shelley, where you left off. It's entitled, Judgment and the Character of God. My name is James Rafferty. And we're looking here in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Now, we are going to be staying in the theme of Hebrews, but for this day, we haven't really been given Hebrews to look at. But if you want to think about, as we read through these verses, what we're talking about, what we're going to be focusing on, judgment and the character of God, the overall foundation for this is going to be Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12. We haven't really gotten there yet. We're still in Hebrews 10, kind of moving towards that direction. But we'll see how what we're going to look at now connects with Hebrews 11 and Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, Romans chapter 3 beginning with verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the fairness of God, without the law is manifest to being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus mm. Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. There's no difference between believers and those that don't believe when it comes to God doing what's right. That's right. The righteousness of God. God has to do what's right. And he does this through the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, the faith of Jesus is something that Jesus wants us to have. But before we have it, he has it. It's his faith before it's our faith. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher Amen. of faith. And that's, of course, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. So Jesus Christ has this faith toward us before we have faith back toward him. And that faith causes him, well, it says here, to be presented for those who are all and for those who believe. That is, according to Romans chapters 1 and 2, everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, wow. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Then it goes on to say, for all have sinned, that's past tense, and come short, present tense, continual of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Hallelujah. Through the mm -hmm. redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Right. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's right. <laughs> Whom, it says in verse 25, God has set forth Jesus Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justify him that believes in Hallelujah. Jesus. These are the verses that we're looking at here in Thursday's lesson. I want to read from the NIV these last two verses, verses 25 and 26. Here's what the NIV says. I think it's a little clearer. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through his blood, excuse me, through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, or we could say to demonstrate his justice. Why? Why did God need to demonstrate his justice? Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let's just stop there for just a second. This verse is telling us that up until the coming of Christ, we might even say even to our time, 
no one has been punished for Amen. sin. Mm. No one Amen. has been punished for sin. And you might say, well, what about the, the, you know, the antediluvians? You know, God flooded the world. And what about, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, where God just brimmed fire and brimstone? Well, that actually wasn't punishment. The ultimate punishment for sin is the second death. That's Amen. right. And the Bible indicates that there is no one who has actually experienced that punishment but one, and that is Jesus. Jesus. That's why in Psalm 51, David is repenting of his sin with Bathsheba, and he actually says there in Psalm 51, verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Mm. Because Jesus, God in the person of humanity, is the only one that has actually experienced the ultimate consequence of sin. God in his forbearance has not brought that consequence upon the world. Why? Because the faith of Jesus says, you know what? If I die, if I become a man, if I take their sin upon, if I carry that sin, I believe that if they see that, I believe that if I be lifted up, John chapter 12, verse 32, that it'll draw all unto me. I believe that. That's my faith toward humanity. And that faith toward humanity is going to be rewarded in those that actually exercise yes. faith back to Jesus, who appreciate what he's done, who respond <laughs> yeah. to what he's done, mm. and who allow what he's done to be lived out in their lives. And so the author here is saying that this is the, why, the reason why we have a judgment. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have a judgment that's connected with the character of God is because the character of God is being revealed through Jesus and that revelation actually causes us to make a decision. Are we going to accept that or not? Mm -hmm. And the judgment is where we figure out mm -hmm. right. if we've accepted that or not. See, we're not <laughs> saved by our works. We're saved by grace. Amen. But our works testify as to whether we've accepted that grace. Amen. Have we accepted that salvation? Yes. Because if we have, there's going to be fruit in our lives. If we've accepted what Jesus Christ has done for us, if we have received the faith he's exercised toward us, if we have the faith of Jesus that he exercised towards us, we are actually going to keep the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's why Revelation chapter 14 closes out with this beautiful picture in the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Here are they that have or keep the faith of Jesus, the faith that he's exercised toward us, that's the gospel, and the commandments of God, the fruit Amen. of that faith, obedience in their lives. So when we look at this, it's powerful because what happens with God's people is this mediation in the judgment applies to all who receive the grace of Jesus Christ. And as, that, as, as it is applied to them, their record comes up. Have they accepted? Their record comes up. And Hebrews chapter 11 tells us what that record looks like. You see Noah who was faithful to preach for 120 years. Hebrews 11 doesn't mention that he got drunk in his tent. That's right. You see, Abraham, who stepped out in faith, you know, not knowing where he was going, doesn't say that he lied about his wife, me and his sister, twice. You see, Moses, who refused to be called Pharaoh's son and suffered affliction with the people of God, doesn't say that Moses killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Mm -hmm. There is no record in Hebrews 11 of the failures of God's people. Yeah. Because they are standing in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's they are standing in the blood of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And all of their record has been blotted out. Hebrews 11 could be a perfect example of the investigative judgment that vindicates the character of God because God said, I believe if these people see me and accept me that their lives will be transformed and they will be returned to obedience mm -hmm. They will be returned to faithfulness to my law. There's a closing statement we want to look at here. It's in the quarterly. Speaking of this judgment, Ellen G. White wrote, quote, Man cannot meet these charges himself. That is, the accusations that Satan is bringing against us in this judgment time. In his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith, the faith of Jesus, have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. Hallelujah. His perfect obedience to God's law even unto the death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and earth, and he claims of his Father mercy and reconciliation for a guilty man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His perfect obedience is how we stand in the judgment. Well, what about our obedience? Well, our obedience testifies that we trust in his obedience. Amen. 
But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely wholly upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. That's taken from 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Mm. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. Why is that? Because he perfectly obeyed God's law. Mm. And in the judgment, the law of God is the perfect standard. Mm. And it has to be met perfectly. And only Christ was able to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. But guess what? He did that so that we can put our trust in Him and our lives and hearts can be transformed. The perfect righteousness of Christ is not an excuse to turn that grace into a license to sin. Amen. Mm -hmm. You preach. Jude it. warns us not to allow people to convince us that they're going to slip in among us. But we've got to earnestly contend for the faith, Jude says in verses 3 and 4. Christ alone can make an effectual plea on our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but upon his own. And that's Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 471 and 472. And I would encourage you, copy that. If you have access to those writings, copy that. I have a, a copy of that in the front of my Bible. I read it often because it reminds me of this beautiful picture of the investigative judgment and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at our lesson for Thursday, the title of this lesson is Judgment and the Character of God. God's character is going to be vindicated mm -hmm. in this judgment because we're going to be seeing Jesus Christ as he really is and the faith of Jesus toward us. Amen. 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 Thank you, James. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Jill. A few closing thoughts. What do you have? Uh, Monday's lesson, we looked at diverse kinds of offerings. The five offerings, burnt grain, peace, sin, and reparation, and they all point to Jesus. Amen. A scripture I didn't have an opportunity to read, uh, but Hebrews chapter 13, verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside of the camp, bearing his reproach. Let us be drawn to our Savior today. Amen. My lesson, the, the cross and the cost of forgiveness. Let me read 1 Peter 2, 18 and 19. Knowing you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We've heard the phrase, one for all and all for one. I like to turn it on end and say, one, the one Jesus Christ for all, so that all could be for the one. That's good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I like thank that. you so much, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We have had an exciting study, and we still have some more lessons to go. But I'd like to just remind you that um, when we talk about this beautiful sacrifice, why sacrifices were needed, let's not forget that the ultimate, the pinnacle of our salvation is centered in Christ and Christ alone. We find in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life mm -hmm. and this life is in his son. So when you think about eternal life, think about Jesus. He's the only source of eternal life. Join us next week for lesson number 10, Jesus opens the way through the veil. Amen. Amen.